Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is Rethinking Fulfillment with Guy Cortan. Did I say that right? No, you did. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) I was practicing before we came online. So, Guy, please introduce yourself and your company. Absolutely, Joe. Thank you so much. And really looking forward to this. So again, my name is Guy Courtin. I'm the Director of Global Alliances here at Six River, who is a Shopify company. Six River, for those of you who don't know, we're one of the leading automation companies in warehouse management. So our solution, which is truly a full solution software and robotics, is to help our customers do a better job, be more efficient in their picking worlds, in their warehouses, to meet all the challenges of e-commerce, but also for B2B and other B2C companies. So really exciting times for us and being part of the Shopify family has been nothing but goodness for us and really looking forward to this year and beyond. Yeah, we'll have to, when we're at the end here, we'll have to remind everybody you've got that upcoming conferences and Flow? Correct. So that's going to be, uh, we'll talk about that, but that's throughout the year. We'll have a bunch of events and yes, Flow will be hopefully live, but probably virtual again this year, but we'd love to have people participate. I will for sure know when it is because it keeps popping up on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gabe, before we get into the topic, please introduce yourself. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? And tell us about that French name of yours. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. So yeah, as you can tell, you know, I go by Guy, not Guy. That's because I'm Parisian or I'm French, but born in Paris, lived there uh, my early childhood, still have family in France. So I thoroughly enjoy going back for work and for other reasons. Unfortunately, 2020 was the first year probably ever that I have not been able to go back to France to visit family. And and I think for many of us, we were stuck at home. So I think we're on the same boat. But, you know, I've been in supply chain now for 20 years. So did you grow up in France or did you grow up in the U.S.? I grew up in, well, I lived in Paris until I was about five. Then I moved to the Northeast. So I lived in a town called Chumford, Massachusetts, and then went to junior high and high school in New Haven, Connecticut. But as a child, I would go back and spend the summers with my grandmother every year. So some of the best memories I have, but truly fortunate to get to spend, you know, three months out of the year each year back in France with my grandmother and family. So, you know, still feel very, very connected to the homeland, if you will. Yeah. So was French your first language? It was my first language. And I, kind of half joke, but you know, my parents told me when we moved to the States, so my mother, for everyone to know, my mother is Chinese, so I'm, I'm half French, half Chinese. When my parents moved back to the States when I was, you know, five years old, six year old little boy, she said I could speak French, English, and Mandarin all the same level. And of course, now looking back on it, I've lost my Mandarin. And I kind of give them the side eye every time saying, you know, if I could speak fluent Mandarin today, the world would truly be my oyster. Right. You know, I, as most people in their 50s, I learned French in, I guess, junior high. I had a few years of French. But the problem is the only people we could ever talk to here in Michigan were people in our class. So, you know, we didn't have French places. And then I remember one time going to Montreal and one of my very smart friends decided I'm going to speak French. And we begged him not to, but he did. And they did not like it because no, that no, was the wrong dialect. Yeah, the wrong dialect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And we, we said, don't do it. Don't do it. He ordered his breakfast and the, it was unpleasant. We could tell we weren't welcome. That was not welcome. But uh, so you really of that, you're not one culture, two cultures, you're like three cultures, right? Yeah, I certainly, uh, I've always been sort of fortunate to have that multicultural background. And it's something I don't think about, but I guess it's just part of my DNA. And, you know, like I said, sort of a funny, funny backstory. My my mom came from China to study the United States. My dad came from France to study the United States. And they met in New York City, which is such an American story, right? They met. Right. uh, (laughs) You're an all-American boy. Yeah. And they both went to Columbia and met each other in New York. I spent a lot of time in China and the, the Chinese people that I worked with did not like after a while how we mispronounced their names. So they would say, give me a nickname. So they'd be like Duke or <laughs> Roy or whatever. And so I said, well, I want a Chinese nickname. So I was Bu Hao Zhou. So those ah, of you, <laughs> so, nice. like, which I guess translates to bad Joe or very bad Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I was introduced as Bu Hao Zhou, the people laughed because I guess it was an unusual nickname. But anyway, I remember none of my Mandarin either. So 
Anyway, Guy, where'd you go to college? What'd you study? And then yep. give us some career highlights before you joined Shopify Six River. Yeah. So like I said, you know, been in the space for 20 years, but it's interesting because I went to Holy Cross College in Worcester, Mass for my undergraduate and studied political science. So I'm a political scientist by trade, so to speak. And then actually went to Loyola University in Chicago for my master's in international relations. So, you know, early on, I thought I, I don't know what I was going to do, but I knew I was always interested in politics and in world affairs. I did study some computer science and sort of a highlight sort of early in my career was I ended up at Forrester Research in the late 90s, early 2000s, which was really, you know, for lack of a better term, not to be overly dramatic on this, but really pivotal for me. Why? Because it was right during the dot-com boom. Forrester was, had a front seat, if you will, in that whole experience. And, and really some of the you know, things I saw and experienced and was able to participate in during that time has stuck with me, you know, oh, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, like sort of a funny side story about this. But I remember, you know, Amazon was obviously a client of ours, and Jeff Bezos and such would come in. And this is when they were selling books and CDs. And they were just kind of this, oh, my you know, God, <laughs> cute little startup trying to do this thing called e commerce. But even back then, I rem- you know, still remember some of the things he would talk to us about. When I look back on it, I was like, wow, he, he truly was a visionary and saw way ahead. But then I also saw a lot of interesting companies who, you know, had sort of drank the Kool-Aid of the e-commerce world without really understanding it and paid for it. And I think some of the lessons I took from that is just, you know, this world of tech, sometimes we we certainly tend to overpromise at times. And it's very important to sort of stay grounded with regards to what is, yes, there needs to be an art of the possible, but then you also need to have a sense of reality of what can be. But again, it, it was really, for me, a really great experience and, and certainly one that, that I will continue to draw from the rest of my career in life. After that, I went to you know Babson for my MBA and then came out of business school and sort of fully got launched in supply chain. Uh, went to I2 Technologies, which for those of you guys who remember supply chain vendors, you know, was really the, the rocket ship uh, That's right. We worked at, we worked at, I, I was a client of yeah. iTunes at the same time. I worked on that over inside of Chrysler. We were working with a resource development tool and we used I2. Yeah. And as you remember, Joe, right, we were the superstars out there and then we probably flew a little too close to the sun and, uh, <laughs> right. and our wings, you know, our wings more than melted. But um, that was, you know, that was one of the, the, I learned a lot on that project. I'll tell you what I learned was when you have a really good system, don't keep modifying it for your own usage. Because that was the thing at the time is we'll customize it. Well, you have this really robust software that we customized to the point that it was no longer robust. And I was like, that was our flying too close to the sun, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you say that, Joe, I think the problem from our side, the I2 side was we thought, hey, we can make this even better for the customer. and then. All of a sudden, we realized, well, now the customer addressable market is one, and that's the one we just did it for. There's no one else that can use this. Um, <laughs> but anyways, lessons learned. And, and again, much like my experience at Forrester, you know, I, too, has certainly made a massive imprint on my career and where I've gotten to because of I, too. And I certainly look back on those days, you know, with nothing but happiness. And, and yes, there were some tough times, but I made some tremendous relationships and friendships and learned a ton working, you know, under Sanjeev and the rest of the leadership team at I2. You know, and then you fast forward, you know, went through a number of different places, spent time as an industry analyst. So, you know, certainly got more time on that side of the table covering the space, which was always helpful to see it from that perspective. And again, most recently, you know, uh, was fortunate enough to join Six River, right when the Shopify acquisition happened. So let me ask you, what? So first off, tell everyone what I think everyone knows what Shopify. Well, let's do both. What is Six River before Shopify bought it? Even yeah, even before and even today, I think we still maintain this philosophy, right? I think it's it's really if you look at it, you know, Shopify came out of a number of executives from Kiva. And those of you who remember Kiva, right? Kiva was one of the first robotic systems, automation systems in the warehouse that was independent of a, a hardwired, hard steel in the ground type system like a conveyor. And Kiva was a goods to person system. Amazon then acquired them, right? So it became Amazon Robotics. And a number of the executives, you know, came out of that with that experience and decide, hey, let's go back and revisit this need in the warehouse for empowering employees with better fulfillment solutions and not just the automation, the robots, but the overall solution. And that's how they founded Six River. So we 
just celebrated our fifth anniversary last summer. So 2020 summer was our five-year anniversary. So we're coming up on our six-year anniversary this year. And again, it's been a really interesting... So what drew you to uh, that company after... I mean, because you had never been in that in the uh, robotics piece. You were always in the, more of the tech and the supply chain. What drove you to or drew you to this to Six River System? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a really good question, Joe. I think it's sometimes with these situations in life, right? It's all about timing and where you are. And I was just coming out of a role... Where again, to your point, I was vice president of industry and solution at Infor, where I was more on the traditional software side. And then with Six River, it was an opportunity to pivot a bit, still stay in supply chain, you know, still work in the field that I've grown to really love. But now to look at it from a different perspective, which was around the automation, the robotics side, which, you know, to me certainly is on an interesting growth path right now and certainly for the foreseeable future, really exciting. And it was just a chance to, to stretch a new muscle, if you will, but to still leverage what I learned and, and what I'd applied to in the past. Right. So tell us what is Shopify. I know what it is because I've just another podcast on it, but a lot of people have heard the name, but they don't know what it does, what the company does. Yeah, what's interesting, and I think what's really exciting about being part of Shopify is the vision that Toby and others have at Shopify about being able to empower retailers, you know, from small to medium to really even now large size to be able to provide all the services needed to meet their customer needs. So what do I mean by that? I think everything from the front end, you know, what is it you need to do a transaction, to have inventory available, to be able to transact on that inventory, to then be able to fulfill those orders, right? Because I think, and we're going to talk about that, I think, as we go through this podcast, but really that key component of, it's one thing, and this is something, you know, I, I talked about being at Forrester in the late 90s, but this is something I certainly took this lesson, which was, you know, that ability to promise or to make you as a consumer able to transact is actually kind of easy. What's really hard is now to say, oh, well, Joe, you ordered, you know, you just ordered that new model ship building thing you need. It's easy for me to tell you, you can buy it and take your money. Now I got to get it to you. And I think right. that's what, you know, Shopify is really, you know, in the mission of doing, which is to provide these brands and retailers the ability to quickly spin up those capabilities and those muscles they need to truly become, you know, I'm going to use the term omnichannel. I don't love the term omnichannel, but to truly become retail powerhouses where they can meet their customers' needs wherever and whenever they have to. And I think that's, it sounds really simple, but man, it's a real big challenge. And I think Shopify is certainly going to lead the way in that. Yeah, I think about when you look at e-commerce, we have these giant companies, Walmart and Amazon and others that are extremely capable. I love, I I buy a lot of stuff. Well, I don't buy a lot of stuff, but if I'm buying online, I buy stuff from Amazon. And why? It's just so simple. And if you're a retailer, either, you know, coming from the e-commerce space or coming from bricks and mortar to compete with them, if you want to start, you know, start from scratch, good luck. Yeah. You need Shopify. And I just did a podcast on this, and we were talking about Shopify as the way to compete. I mean, if you want to compete at a high level, and that's where you're going to have to compete at online, you got to get Shopify. I mean, I'm not saying that is a salesy thing. I'm saying that is <laughs> there's not a lot of other options. Right. And I do think, you know, to be honest, too, I think when we look at, you know, in our role and Shopify as a whole, I certainly think that it provides a tremendous range of tools that you need to then compete at that level. But at the end of the day, you also need to come to it. When I say you, I mean, you know, our customers, you still still need to come to it with good product and all that good stuff because, and we'll get to this in a second, but technology is not a panacea by itself. Oh, so there's no silver bullet. Damn it. Yeah, I know. It's a consistent theme on this podcast. There's no silver bullets. So anyway, interesting stuff. Let's talk about today's topic, which is rethinking fulfillment. So let's give us kind of the lay of the land, some of the problems and maybe even some of the opportunities you see, but focus on some of those challenges initially on fulfillment and why we need to rethink what we're doing. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Joe, because I feel like fulfillment is kind of like the warehouse or like, you know, now I'm hearkening back to my supply chain software days, right? TMS, WMS, it's kind of seen as, you know, sort of the redhead step trial of supply chain, right? It's not as sexy as planning and things like that. But the reality is when we think about fulfillment and we think about what has changed, all of us sitting on this podcast, listening to it, all of us in our regular lives have truly made fulfillment, A, become much more challenging. But B, become a differentiator at some level, you know, in our experience with brands, with retail, even in business to business, right? It's not just 
B to C, it's B to B. It's it's really anything that we transact in. The notion of fulfillment is no longer, you know, and, and I'm oversimplifying this, but it's no longer. Oh, you know, I sell something to Joe. I put it in a box and I give it to USPS, and you know, I'm done. <laughs> right? It has truly become an integral differentiator for brands, for retailers, with regard to their customers. Part of that is because our friends over at Amazon have changed the perspective of, yeah, you should expect stuff quickly. You should expect stuff in two days, or if not two hours. I would challenge that by saying that's not necessarily the right way of thinking about it, but the aspect of fulfillment, the way we acquire or we get the inventory to us is becoming as much a differentiator, as much a thing that we look at as consumers, as the product, as the price, as all those other aspects that you know we traditionally think about when it comes to retail all those things. Yeah. You know, when I think about right now, if you said, Joe, you're going to become an e-commerce and sell online, my first thought would be, great, I'll get a really slick website and I'll start driving traffic to that. And then, we'll, you know, hook up that back end with something like Shopify and get a fulfillment company helping me out. And then you start to realize, well, yeah, but Joe, how long will it take for you to drive that traffic? Mm-hmm. It's not easy, right? Yeah. It's not cheap or easy. Then you go, well, maybe I'll just jump over there and get on Amazon and become one of their sellers. And I've talked about Amazon FBA on this podcast a number of times. That's no silver bullet either because the bar has gotten way high over there. Mm -hmm. Amazon only wants to work with people who are really have their operations in order. You have to have your inventory tight. You have to have a good idea what you're going to sell. And also, this is the challenge. If I say, boy, I just sold $10 million through Amazon. I'm killing it. I know what I'm doing. Amazon's looking and saying, hey, we sold $10 million worth of Joe's product. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I might think I sold it. Amazon's like, no, Joe, you're a supplier. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the, the scary part is that Amazon might say, hey, you know what? We can do the same thing and make it cheaper and we'll sell it, you know, right. we'll the same amount of stuff and we'll make, you know, 2% margin, but we'll make it. So let's just talk supply chains because you're knowledgeable of this, Guy. Let's just say I have a supply chain and Jeff Bezos has a supply chain. I'm really good at this. I've been doing it for a long time. Do you think I'm better than Jeff Bezos' supply chain? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I will say this. I will say this. You know, I think it's an interesting challenge for people out there to think about, Joe. But I do think that I also think we don't necessarily have to just sort of throw our hands up and allow the Jeff Bezos supply chain to overwhelm us because they don't necessarily do everything well either, right? Some of it is they just sheer muscle stuff through. They literally can just overwhelm or absorb the cost, if you will, to do certain things. And and yeah, you know, it works and they get away with it because of who they are. But I also think that, and maybe I'm being naive on this, but I certainly have a, a feeling that supply chains are always evolving, always changing. You know, we certainly, I look at supply chains like you know, Walmart supply chain is pretty darn impressive. You know, I look at some of the other big, big retailers and CPGs who have impressive supply chains. I look at Nike, right, who made it very clear they're, they're getting off the Amazon platform and selling direct to consumer. Well, guess what? You know, Phil Knight's got a pretty darn good supply chain as well. And I think he can. And I think if you trickle that down, you look at other brands, other companies. I certainly think that. To your, you know, yes, you know, we certainly don't want to dismiss it, but I certainly think that there are plenty of tools out there, and Shopify obviously being, I think, one provider of excellent tools, but there are others where you can arm yourself or you can have a pretty darn sophisticated, savvy supply chain that could not compete at the global scale of an Amazon, but if you're just competing in a region or on a niche or, or very laser focused, you know, you can still find a lot of joy in that. And I think that's that's the exciting part to me, right? Is I, I still feel, if you look at mainstream media, you might think that, well, the world's just handed over to Amazon and Walmart. No, of course not. not. Right? I think there, I think there are also going to be new opportunities in the future where you'll be able to better compete. But right now, if it's you create your own branded site that has some challenges getting the traffic, going on Amazon, I was just saying, they're, they're a marketplace. Their job is to provide that consumer lots of choices. And my branded website is to provide you with choices I want you to make. So that's that becomes the challenge. And again, brick and mortar has its own challenges, but there's going to be opportunities that pop up. So I don't think, to your point, I don't think you just throw your hands up in the air and surrender and say, you know, we can't compete. Right. 
So Guy, I want to talk about some of these challenges. One is these customer expectations are going higher and higher. And I know one of the things we talked about when we were prepping is maybe they've gone so high because we have this sense that everything's free. Yeah. And they say, hey, I want that. I got free shipping. Well, it's not really free. Somebody else absorbed the cost somewhere, right? Absolutely. And I think you're spot on. I think the first driver for all this is absolutely, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but to reemphasize it is we the consumer, right? All of this on this podcast, listening to it, all of us out there who as consumers are, unfortunately, for those of us who work in supply chain, are making our day jobs that much more of a challenge. <laughs> and part of that too is this, you know, maybe part of it is is people have gotten a little bit more eyes wide open now during the pandemic of the importance of supply chain and also how things aren't necessarily, they look, they are free to you, but they're not free to the system. And right. I think part of that right. is, you know, for example, I remember during the pandemic when it started, and we all you know, we don't need to laugh at it, but people were like, oh my God, there's no more toilet paper. Well, if you understand supply chain, you understand why that is, right? You all of a sudden had this major demand spike that was unintended and your supply chain just can't keep up quickly enough. It doesn't mean that toilet paper won't show up, right. but we take for granted that when we go to the grocery store, that items and inventory are on the shelf. We take for granted that when I click buy on certain items through my phone or my laptop or my iPad, that the shipping will be free or shipping will be very inexpensive. We as consumers, our expectations have been set in such a way that we no longer think about some of the actual costs associated with it and who's actually paying for it. And I think that at some level, the challenge will be is how do we bring some of the realities and the expectations sort of back in harmony with one another moving forward? Right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. Consumers are irrational. We're all irrational in our buying behavior. And you're in Boston, I'm in Detroit area. It's wintertime. And what's weird is, you know, they'll say, we're going to get two inches of snow, which is nothing around here, right? It shouldn't do anything. Once the weatherman says it's two inches of snow, you go to the grocery store, and if you didn't know better, you'd think it's a blizzard. And I know Boston's even worse because they have that history of yeah. snowmageddon. <laughs> and, yeah, um, and we, we all rush out and buy bread and milk for some reason. I, I, I guess right. we all make French toast. We're going to starve to death. Yeah, we all make French toast for snow. But I, yeah, there's this irrationality about consumers and about buying. And yeah, that's the right. same with the toilet paper. You go, you know what? I heard there's a toilet paper shortage. I'm going to go buy as much as I possibly can. <laughs> so the consumer expectations, as far as especially related to cost, is a little out of whack. But then speak to flexibility, because I think this is a fascinating one. And it really does get to the heart of that omni-channel, as you said, and fulfillment. We all of a sudden expect I can get it any which way I want. Speak to that. Yeah, and I think that goes back to our earlier discussion, too, about fulfillment being an important part of the experience. And I think part of that is also the flexibility. So it's not just flexibility about, oh, do I get it in two days or two hours? You know, does it FedEx, UPS, DHL, whomever, a micro delivery company that comes bring it to me? Now we're looking at things, right, like Bopac, Bopis, right? Buy online, pick up in store. Buy online, pick up at curb. You know, an interesting anecdote on this is I heard NRF talking to uh, the CEO of Lowe's during the pandemic, and he made a really interesting statement where he said in 2020, when they started, Lowe's had this Bopac, so buy online, pick up at curb, fulfillment model on their roadmap. And all of a sudden, COVID hit and they accelerated. And they said, no, no, we need to give this right now. And, and all of a sudden now, you know, we've gotten used to or we're becoming used to, well, maybe if I just want to order three bags of mulch and, you know, a rake and a shovel and some flowers, I don't want to go in the store. I just want to pull up, open the trunk and have someone bring it out to me, right? right. So right. I want that Bopac model or I want that model. We've seen this before, right? I want to order it and I want to walk in the store and it's just waiting for me right there. And maybe I'll pick up, you know, an extra two or three things I might need. So that's the, so Bopic is B-O-P-I-C. So it's B-O-P-A-C. Buy online, pick up that store. Okay, yeah, Bopac. And then, curb, and then Bopis, buy online, pick up in store. Yeah, a little unfortunate on me. Yeah, um, it's a little unfortunate. I mean, <laughs> sometimes times we don't think about the acronym. We have to rethink that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the expectation we have. And I read there was something, articles in Forbes magazine about the retail reinvention. And it really was reinvented this year because of COVID. And I know Target now looks at each one of their stores kind of as a fulfillment center. Yeah. And not this Christmas, because my kids didn't come. One of them came. But at Christmas time, my daughters, as they were coming in for town, said, oh, Dad, can you go to Target? I think I made like three trips to Target, that stuff they had bought, and it was picked up. 
And that was, I was like, man, it was kind of like, this is slick. They yeah. really do a nice job. And I'm thinking this is the future. And so the stores that are set up right now is, you know, you go buy stuff and you put it in, you know, get in line. I can see the new stores, them opening up, being much more suited to picking up at the curb or picking up at the store and ordering it online. So very interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting. I just saw an article too recently, I think in England or in the U- somewhere in the UK, they're trying something where, you know, they're using sort of these reconverted containers and it's a personless sort of pickup point, right? And you just come in, scan your QR code, and it will bring out, when I say bring out, it'll sort of spit out your product. You know, when you think about this, and we've seen this, you know, in places like dry cleaning, right? And I think it was Zoots or someone who started doing this many years ago where, you know, you could just go to it any time of day and it was kind of like a big vending machine. But if your dry cleaning was ready, you would just scan your number or punch your number in and it would pull out the dry cleaning that's done and just take it and go. And it was all paid for, you know, you had a credit card online. So I think we're seeing these models really emerge and I think it is the future. And, and you know, did COVID accelerate this? Absolutely. But right. was this already in process? Yes. I think we're, we already started seeing this. You know, just look at companies like CVS and Best Buy and others who started putting in, for lack of a better term, vending machines in airports, right? So if you wanted to buy a pair of Beats by Dre headphones from Best Buy, well, I'm about to get on a plane. I can go to the kiosk, put my credit card in and buy it. If I needed to buy some deodorant and Band-Aids from CVS, well, there was a kiosk right there. I could just buy it from there. There's, there's no one there. Now, vending machines have been around forever. But now we're starting to see different types of inventory being dispensed through those right. vending machines. And I right. think, you know, that was before COVID. I think it's now with COVID, we're seeing that flexibility of fulfillment, that ability to bring inventory to the last mile in a lot of different nodes just explode in front of us, which I think as consumers is really exciting. As a supply chain person, it's like, oh my goodness, like now I've got to you know, replant all these these points. I've got to understand what the demand is for these, like what kind of merchandise I put in them, what's the layout, all those things. But as consumers, I think it's super exciting. Right. So we talked a little bit about Target when we were prepping for this. So what I think is interesting is just that whole, I pick, you know, order it online and then I can pick it up at the store. Or And I think they probably have curb service too. But I think also if Target is treating their stores kind of as fulfillment centers, then you say, well, is the retail, is the person who's checking out at the store or giving or handing you the package, not the cashier, but, you know, the person working at the desk where you pick it up, they're kind of like a fulfillment worker rather than a retailer. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting, I think is fascinating and we'll get into this a little in a minute, is Shipped is owned by Target. And they have yep. 200,000 personal shoppers. And I think that's just scratching the surface. I can see that just growing like a weed. And you start to go, whoa, this is the future right here, right at Target. I can order it online. I can go inside the store. I can have somebody pick it up and drop it off at my place. And I've said this on another podcast, but I'll say it again. My mom is in her 80s. She has an iPad. She set herself up on Shipped, and she orders her groceries from there. I was like, Slick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you think of, so you think about how that sort of taking that notion of fulfillment and of purchasing to the next level. And, and you mentioned ship, but you also look at obviously what's going on in the grocery space and Instacart and folks like that, where, you know, they're going out there doing your shopping for you. I think oh, it's actually. Ship does the same. You yeah. Know, that's, that's what I use with my groceries delivered by those guys. Yeah, it's absolutely now become, and now the, what's interesting, in my opinion, from that standpoint is, okay, so we take grocery, for example, if, you know, Guy and Joe both place an order and we both want avocados, well, avocados are avocados, they're not, right? Some are, maybe I want mine more ripe, maybe you want yours more ready to eat, maybe I want mine, whatever it may be. So all of a sudden now what's interesting from a fulfillment and a, <laughs> right. you know, is these personal shoppers, how do we get them? educated in real time as to our consumer needs and how do we translate it to their ability to acquire that inventory for us. Right. I think that's a really interesting sort of movement and how is that going to look like, you know, in a year or two or five. Yeah, that's exactly right. My one daughter goes, I love shipped, but, uh, you know, I like my produce just a certain way. I'm like, okay, you're too picky. You got to go pick it up yourself. That's, that's right. But we, we inherently, <laughs> inherently, we do this when we're out there at the grocery store on our own, right? We make those decisions without even, in a way, being conscious of them. We just have our behavior and we just do it. Now we're expecting a person who might be handling four or five orders at a time to have that same ability to make that decision. You know, I think that's where the model 
that's the interesting part of the model, right? I, I, we actually see how it evolves because that, that really does involve all these kinds of psychological issues around taste and preference and desire and all that. Right. I, I know we're way past Amazon being just a bookseller, but when they first came out and said, hey, we're going to be your bookseller from now on, I was like, that's cool. But is that the experience that I needed to get rid of going to bookstores? <laughs> like, you could take, if you could take away my experience going to buy garbage cans at Kmart, that would be good. Go ahead and do that for me. But I like going to bookstores. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's absolutely. But again, we understand why Amazon did it, right? It was the same point. It was if, if that book doesn't get to me, on time is a life changing no. Like it'll be a minor nuance or minor disturbance, but I think and also the form factor, right? Books are all pretty much the same form, source CDs, easy to ship. Back to our fulfillment discussion, right? Right. Easy to control that one aspect, that one variable in the fulfillment side, which is the shipping side. Obviously now that's off the table, so to speak, because now we're shipping everything. Yeah, and I use Kindle and more and more, and more I use just Audible. So thank you, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> but so I want to talk about two other things. Well, first, let's talk a little bit about the growth of this sustainability. And then I want to talk about labor because these are really important things when it comes to fulfillment. So speak to what is sustainability when it comes to fulfillment and why we need to concern ourselves with it. Yeah, you know, Joe, it's interesting because sustainability, you know, if I rewind back to 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? It never, it was always kind of like, oh, well, sustainability, the environment. Yeah, those are all nice things and we don't want to destroy the planet, but I can't make any money off of it. We have it in our mission statement. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. We put some words around it, but that's about it. Fast forward to now, and even I, I would say the last few years, you know, I think we're starting to see, which I think is a good thing, we're starting to see the consumer, she's making buying decisions based off of sustainability. And I think there's sort of a couple of tiers of sustainability we want to think about. I think the first one, which is the most evident, is, okay, are you using materials that are safe for the environment? So we're seeing this whole movement towards plastics, right? So plastic straws are out, things of that nature. That's, I don't want to say it's easy, but that's sort of the first surface on the surface. That's sort of the one that we all think about when it comes to sustainability. I think we start going down multiple levels of this, and I think we're going to see more behavior based on that. We're going to start looking at things like sustainability, like the whole notion of the circular aspect of inventory. So how many items are coming back into my returns channel? What are we doing with them? Are we just putting them in landfills? Can we break them down and reuse the material? We're seeing this you know, with consumer electronics where a couple years ago, more than a couple years ago now, but where Europe and Asia passed like Ross and we. And we're basically putting in rules to say, all right, you know, if I sell you a Nokia cell phone or a Apple tablet, I need to make sure that the components can be end of life in such a way that we don't just throw them in the ocean or throw them in a landfill. So we're starting to see that aspect of sustainability. I think a third aspect, which we've touched upon, which I think is only going to become more apparent as we move forward, is again, in the whole fulfillment side. So when you think about this, we know this as supply chain folks that, you know, Moving stuff around, A, isn't free because it costs money for fuel and for product, for trucks and rail and planes and labor, but it also costs the environment, right? There's a carbon emission standpoint. There's a wear and tear. costs the environment, right? Yeah. So I think we're going to look at a, at a sustainability view, if you will, of, okay, if I ship this item from point A to point B, what's my CO2 footprint look like? You know, we're, I always use this example, which I think it's interesting is I mentioned earlier, right? I'm French, I'm Parisian. I love obviously being in Paris and love taking the subway in Paris. And, you know, I have the Metro app on my phone. And while I know the subway pretty well, I still like using it to tell me, you know, what's the best way to get from point A to point B. And, you know, it'll give you options on which Metro lines to take if it's a bus, but it also gives you a CO2 number. Right. It tells you like which way these paths consume oh, nice. carbon. It allows you as a consumer to make the decision. Well, maybe this path is quicker, but I'm going to burn more carbon. So maybe I'll take this other path. Right. I think we're going to start seeing that when, you know, you get items, you'll be told, you know, this to get from point A to point B consume this much carbon or, you know, and maybe part of it is in your shipping. Maybe right. I think, you know, what we'll see is I'll give you as a consumer the option. Do you want it tomorrow? Okay, well, that's going to cost you more. Why? Because I have to expedite it or I have to put it in a less than full truck. But if you let me wait a few days to consolidate shipments, therefore I maximize my shipping cost and lowers my carbon footprint per item. Maybe, you know, I find a way to not only show you that, but incentivize you as a consumer to take that option. Right. And I think the fourth aspect of sustainability, I think, is around labor. I know we'll touch upon that separately, but I certainly think that 
there is an aspect of how do we treat our labor that has to go into this whole notion of sustainability. Right, uh, right. I think it's, it's actually part of it. Yeah, you know, the whole idea of supply chain is still relatively new. I remember probably 20 years ago, some recruiter called me and wanted me to do some job. And he said, you're a great supply chain guy, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, he kept saying it. I was like, I know what a supply is. I know what chains are. <laughs> And I was like, I, God, I'm not so sure what he's talking about, but he, you know, I seem to be qualified for what he was talking about. And he hung up and I called one of my friends, the executive recruiter. I said, what is a supply chain? <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. I worked in automotive, the biggest, baddest supply chain on earth. And we didn't call it that. Yep. No, it was not a job called supply chain. And now we can see the supply chains everywhere. We're getting very transparent. And I, I mean, I'll tell you that I'm going to screw this up a little bit, but Years ago, I remember one of my daughters telling me that I think it was Kylie Jenner has a makeup line, lipstick, lip yep. gloss, whatever. And she was making it on an assembly line that was making another <laughs> lip gloss. And the other lip gloss was really cheap. And hers was like 40 bucks a piece. Yep. And I remember teenage girls talking about it's the same supply chain. It's the same packaging. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I would have had, never had that knowledge yeah. And it was just kind of shocking how we know what supply chains are now. And I keep thinking, if you're a brand like Patagonia or whoever, Allbirds, where you're a B Corp and you value that in, as part of your brand and your people are buying your product because of a brand, you better be able to show a supply chain that does not have a whole bunch of waste, obviously. But also, we'll get to this next, is you better not have a whole bunch of people with bad jobs. I mean, jobs that might be hard to live on or jobs that are physically demanding or jobs where you get hurt. So, Yeah, and it's, it's so shameless plug here too. Like I think the Kylie Jenner line and Allbirds, right, are both on the Shopify network to help them with their supply chain and getting that product out there. But you're absolutely right. It's We've become much more attuned to the fact that there's stuff that ends up at our doorstep or in our grocery stores or in our local stores or in our offices. There's a supply chain behind that. And part of that supply chain is fulfillment. Right. Yeah. So let's speak to the labor because, again, we, we were talking about sustainability. We've always measured our profit. You don't have to tell anybody listening. Make sure you check your profit. Make sure you're making money. But we also have to measure our impact on the planet. And we also have to see how we're treating the people on the planet, starting with our employees and our customers, but also the world at large. So we have to do a better job tracking how we're doing with the labor in the fulfillment process. Yeah, because I think part of it too, Joe, is I think we look at labor, or we have looked at labor, and not to get too far back in history, right? But we look at labor during the Industrial Revolutions as, you know, it was a cost. And like any other asset we had, we try to maximize that cost and drive the most value out of it, and therefore drove the biggest margin we could. And for a lack of a better term, that's why we had children and, you know, working in looms. Why? Because they had small hands and it worked well and they could do the job. And, you know, why we drove people to work seven days a week. But I think we certainly evolved from those days, but I think we are continuing to evolve, in my opinion, from a looking at labor as part of the sustainable equation. And all you have to do is look at, you know, some of the reactions and the actions that have happened. And, I'm, and by no means am I saying we've solved it or it's perfect yet, but I remember you know, when there was the, the tragedy. We're, we're bank, talking about it, at least. <laughs> yeah, we're talking, well, yes, and I think we're making decisions based off of it. But, you know, you look at what happened in Bangladesh many years ago with the cave-in of, of some of the factories there. You know, a lot of the companies using that labor for their apparel really were forced to revisit their labor practices. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's, you know, it's a challenge because, to be blunt, I think then, you know, if it raises the price or the cost, then people grumble the other side, right? Well, why is this costing me more money? So I think we're always having this sort of tug of war between that. But I think because we're able to talk more about it, in a way also, I think because of the digital economy, because the visibility into this aspect of the supply chain is becoming more visible, more apparent, we can't hide it anymore, is a good thing, right? Maybe I'm too cynical on this one. Maybe if people didn't know about this stuff, we would still continue those practices. No, I, well, yeah, it's, somebody would, for sure. And I think now... With the idea that, hey, they're buying from me because we have a great product, an ethical supply chain, and part of that ethical supply chain is fulfillment. And, you know, we have people working, but, you know, I think we'll probably segue a little bit to talk about what humans should do versus what 
technology should do. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, this comes up a lot on my podcast is plain and simple. People should do people work, you know, the stuff that requires a human touch and machines should do the other work that may be routine or heavy lifting or dangerous or easily automated. Yeah. But yeah, so, well, let's switch gears here. So we've talked about some of the problems and I'll just hit them real quick. One is customer expectations, very, very high, maybe even unreasonable sometime. Fulfillment, flexibility, you know, customers are really expect that omni-channel experience. Fulfillment is a differentiator, sustainability and then the potential challenge with labor. So talk about what it would take. I know you guys are rethinking fulfillment, but what does it take if somebody wants to be successful as a company, but also in fulfillment? What should they be doing today? Mm. You know, and I think it's interesting too, Joe. I, I certainly don't think it's one size fits all, right? So I'm going to couch my comments by that by saying, you know, that there's not one solution for everybody. Right. And then everyone's different. Everyone's different. I think first and foremost, and again, I'm going to sound like a cliche here, but start from the outside and work back in. What I mean by that is, what are your customers' expectations now? The blanket statement is they want everything tomorrow. They want it free, blah, 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 right? right. I'm going to say that's a lazy answer. What I mean by that is, no, like understand your customer, your true customer's needs, right? Segment them, understand the personas, understand what it is that they want and what is it that they need. And I think that is where we start. And then we figure out how we then drive our fulfillment strategy based off of that. For example, you know, we talked about this before in our side conversations, but I remember speaking to Louis Vuitton a few years ago in Paris and, you know, Louis Vuitton, a luxury brand, handbags and such. And they have a very small e-commerce initiative. They realize they have to do more, but it's not a big part of their business. But they realize their customers' expectations are around, it's a luxury brand. If I'm spending 2500 bucks on a no way bag, I don't want you just to drop it off of my front stoop, you know, in, <laughs> ungloriously in the middle of the day. Right. Right. In so, a FedEx bag. <laughs> yeah. So Louis Vuitton recognized that part of the experience. Part we, of the, we pronounce that Louis Vuitton over yeah. here. <laughs> West. <laughs> We're just going by LV. Uh, what is, is, is he say, does he say Louis Vuitton? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So LV understood that part of the expectation of the customer was the experience and fulfillment. So they were literally going to have white glove delivery by run by themselves to bring you that item. And, you know, I don't know all the details, like if they were going to bring you some champagne and all this, but I'm sure that there was some kind of 2,500 bucks. There better be a bottle. Yeah, exactly. There's going to be some kind of pop and circumstance <laughs> that goes with it, much like if you go to the store. So what that tells me is that to your question, Joe, you know, they said, hey, what does our customer expect and need? Then how do we translate that or how do we bring that in the fulfillment processes of getting them the inventory? And now, again, it's not one size fits all. So I'm not saying that, you know, when I order my groceries, I expect someone to show up with white gloves and put the stuff away. Maybe I do, and then I'll pay for that service. But, you know, maybe what I want is just, hey, give me my groceries within the time frame I ask you or give me this product. So I think, you know, when we take a fulfillment strategy or when brands and retailers and consumer companies take a, a, a fulfillment strategy, it truly is that notion of let me look at what it is my customer needs and expects. How do I meet those expectations? How do I meet those needs in a profitable way? And how do I structure my fulfillment around that? And I think that's the challenge because I truly do believe that it's not one size fits all. Right. And they might very well, you know, we have just talked about Louis Vuitton wanting something that's very high end. And maybe they say, we're not going to even use packaging because we're in hand delivery. Exactly. exactly. Maybe using a little extra fuel. But and then I think there's going to be other places that say, look, we value sustainability as part of our brand and our customers buy us for that. So we have really reduced packaging. And we've created packaging that is maybe easily recyclable, or maybe there's maybe figure out a way to really minimize it to a point where it's not a huge impact on the environment. Absolutely. And I think there's a whole host of variables that when you think about your fulfillment strategy, you need to consider. So you just mentioned one, which I think is is really spot on is, is it more important for me to get the stuff out quickly? Or is it more important for me to get the stuff out in a more environmentally conscious way? So for example, do I look at how much cartons I use, how much, you know, corrugated I use. Can I reduce that? Can I consolidate orders, right? All the tricks we know in supply chain, but maybe instead of looking at it just purely 
in terms of, oh, you know, I need to get the stuff out. So we've all seen this, right? We might order four items from an e-commerce player and we get four different boxes. And it's like, wait a minute, what? It's all right. that into one? Maybe from your fulfillment strategy, it's not just this knee-jerk reaction of, all right, Joe, place the order, get the stuff out, right? No, it's Joe, place the order. Joe's needs right. are that he gets this within two weeks. Joe's wants are is that he wants you to be more efficient. So I'm going to wait and consolidate those orders and get it out to him in 10 days, but it's going to be in one box and it's all be together. So I think that's what we need to think about when it comes to fulfillment. You know, and one of the things I always tell people too, Joe, is we need to get away from, and I, you know, maybe I'm going to die on that hill and I'm yelling in an empty room about this, but I feel as if this notion of fulfillment faster and faster, two days, two hours, what have you, is misconstrued. I think it's fulfillment on the time frame of the consumer, right? So right. that's something we had a little bit of talk offline about this is, you know, we're in the age of venture capital. And sometimes you're working with somebody and you go, God, I don't know how they're doing that. And they're saying something along the lines of we lose $20 a transaction, but we're gaining market share quickly. <laughs> and there's this race that's happening. At some point, their investors are going to say, we would like you to make some money now. So, so, so you have to raise your cost. And if you're competing against that, and we are competing against that, we all are competing against that, you have to figure out how do I, what is real and what is, you know, again, the cost being absorbed somewhere else. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'll go back to the beginning of this podcast, right, where I talked about my time at Forrester. And I remember talking to customers back then, you know, this is 98, 99, 2000 timeframe. And I literally had some people who would come in to exactly to your point, Joe, who would basically say, you know, you want to buy a tractor or a roll of toilet paper, we'll sell it to you. And I was like, the cost of fulfilling that is so outrageous. Like, what are you? And they're, like they're like, it doesn't matter. Like, we just want to get eyeballs and we want to get, you know, like you said, market share. It yeah, like, that, 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 it reminds me of that dot com boom where somebody said, we don't use traditional financial metrics. We just say how many eyeballs we had. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I, you know, and I think what, what we learned is that traditional financial metrics are traditional financial metrics for a reason. Like, at the end of the day, you either made money or you lost money. And at some point, if you lose too much money, you get no more money, right? And I think that's the problem. And I think fulfillment, you know, when we think about it, I, and I do think this, you know, let me take a step back too. I do think we as consumers, while at times we act very irrationally, I also do believe, and, and maybe this is my eternal optimism, I also do believe that we as consumers, if you explain to us and make it clear to us how that fulfillment's going to happen, even some of the costs associated, we will accept that and we will make the right decision. And maybe some consumers will say, well, I'm not shopping your brand anymore because I want it tomorrow. That's okay. You were never going to meet those expectations anyway. So better lose that customer than lose the money. Right. But for me, I feel like as consumers, yes, we might grumble at times, but I think as long as you are clear as a retailer, you know, brand, what have you, as to what your fulfillment will look like, the cost, the timing and all that, we as consumers, as long as we get it, understand it, it's a product we like. It's an experience we enjoy. We're going to stick with it, in my opinion. You know, now I certainly don't think we're going to go back to the days of and sort of harkening back to my childhood. And I mentioned being in France and, and spending time with my grandmother. Like, I'm a big soccer fan. And I remember as a kid, you know, I'd always want to get the, a soccer jersey, a French soccer jersey. And then back in the day, you would do the old fashioned thing. You go to this, you know, the back of a the magazine, there'd be a catalog there. You would cut it out. You would send the check in. And, I remember that? <laughs> yeah. And then you would just wait and wait. But it was like, oh my God, you know, you, you would forget it, about it before yeah, you it, about it show up and you're like, oh my, this is the greatest day ever. Obviously that is no, but we don't want to go back to those days. But at the same point, you know, and this might be a bad analogy, but I always use this sometimes. I say, remember the day we used to travel, remember they used to fly and you would pay no baggage fees. All of a sudden the airline's like, this costs money. We're going to charge you for it. We grumbled. We still pay for it. People, I haven't seen people not fly because they have to pay for baggage fees. It's the same thing with this. Like if all of a sudden, we now I say we collectively as supply chain professionals, we say, you know, this costs money, this costs the environment. We're going to charge you want that product overnight, we can get it to you overnight, it's going to cost you. You want to wait three days, it'll cost you less, right? And, and I think savvy retailer, savvy brands will look towards that, but they have to be transparent, clear, and openly communicative to their consumers so that they understand that, that there are decisions to be made, there are trade offs, and free is not free. Right. So what you're saying, it, you know, that to be successful going forward, we're all going to have to kind of step back and, you know, re-examine what the customer really wants and needs. And also, you know, again, this is that fresh eyes that I think tech guys are so good at these days is we're going to really explore 
that customer experience from beginning to end and develop the right solution. You know, one other thing I'd like to talk about, and we talked a little bit about this when we we're prepping, is the other side of that, which is the people who are actually doing the fulfillment in warehousing. Speak to the what we need to do to be successful going forward on that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think that's one of the big variables, Joe, that we always look at that I think is also hidden, so to speak, from we as consumers. But we don't really think of it or see it. And I think the warehouse distribution center is going to play or is playing an ever-increasing role in how we get product to consumer. And part of that, or an integral part of that, is the labor within those warehouses. And what we're seeing more of, and, and of course, you know, we at Six River are certainly focused and working on this specific area, is how do we bring more technology, more automation, not to replace the labor, but to make that labor more efficient, to make that labor more effective, and in a way, to make the labor more the people themselves want to work in those environments more. So right. I think that's that's what we're seeing, you know, moving forward. And this gets back to we this this is I think there, there's going to be a guy on my podcast coming up, my friend Shana, and one of the things he spent some time in warehouses. He's a CEO of another company, and he went and worked in six different warehouses. And what he learned is a lot of the guys working in these facilities. What he found out is they all talk about the gig economy. And we we all know this, if given the choice of I will go in this fulfillment center and I will lift heavy things and I will be uh, on the clock, so to speak, driving lift sounds a lot better to me. <laughs> right. Going to work at Shipped and being a personal shopper, hallelujah, sign me up. I'll take some classes and I'll work at Shipped. And I think, you know, I also have heard this, that some of these people are sleeping in their cars, working long hours. And we all know this. It's just a matter of time before you start getting injuries. By the time you're done that for a few years, you're going to have back problems. So it's not something that we're going to be proud of if we don't do something to make that a decent experience for them because they won't be there. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's the interesting from a labor perspective the whole gig economy, the whole digitization of our economy has put a lot of strain on some parts of labor and then opened up other parts of labor and employment. And I think it's an ever-changing model, so to speak. And I think it's interesting to see where it's going to evolve. But I think to your point, we've certainly seen in the warehouse is A, labor continues to be, even during COVID with unemployment rates, unfortunately, going very high, labor in the warehouse continues to be a massive need. Right. And I think part of that is a what we just talked about, right? Consumers putting more and more pressure on the network to get more stuff out. B, it's a tough job, right? It this is not an easy job. I heard some of these companies in the middle of COVID were 30% absenteeism. And they, I talked to multiple fulfillment centers and they said they'd given multiple raises, but you know, people were just weren't available. Maybe they worked in fulfillment, but then their kids home from school or maybe they're at high risk or their spouse is at high risk. And they said, Hey, government sending me money. I will just wait this thing out. Yeah. yeah. You well, made rational tough. decisions. Yeah. It's a tough, it's a tough, tough job, but it's incredibly necessary and important. And I think one of the future states of it is how do companies like ours and others work with these companies, these warehouses to make the job, you know, not easier because it's, it's always gonna be hard, but make it so that, you know, they can be more efficient, more effective and, and also more attractive, right? I mean, we've certainly heard this that we've had some warehouses say, hey, the ability to work with the type of automation you provide, labor likes that, right? It makes their job easier, but it also makes their job cool, right? They're working with robots. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, I spoke about being an automotive guy. I used to go, to, if you went to an uh, auto assembly plant 30 years ago, 50 years ago, that was a job that you could very easily be hurt in, just the nature of it. It was also a job that when you came home, you were sweaty, you were dirty, you were tired. There's a lot of jobs, most jobs in auto facilities now, there's a lot of automation and there's not nearly, the injuries are very rare compared to the past. I would say they're very rare just in general, but the same thing's going to happen to fulfillment. You're just not going to be able to keep, you know, at some point somebody's going to realize that they're going to have repetitive use injuries and strenuous work for 30 years where you're lifting. This doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that's where we're seeing the rise of automation you know, play a massive part in that. And I think that's really exciting moving forward. Yep. So, Guy, I know we talked a lot about a lot of things, but summarize this topic for us. Yeah, you know, we've certainly covered a lot, Joe, so I really appreciate you having me on this. But I think for me, when I look at this, you know, when it comes to sort of when we rethink fulfillment, I think we, cliche, but we start with the customer, right? We start with who we're addressing and move backwards. We look at 
different forms of being able to fulfill different forms of being able to get the inventory to that last mile. And I think part of that too is this notion of our environmental footprint, right? How do we make sure that we are sustainable, right? Because fulfillment as part of the experience and fulfillment as part of the bigger equation when it comes to sustainability, I think are all intermeshed together uh, when it comes to meeting our needs for today and tomorrow, which I think are only going to grow But I think they're going to grow in many different ways and they're going to continue to evolve. So fulfillment has to keep up with that because I think, and I certainly don't think we've, I'll say we mastered it. But we're in the infancy. (laughs) Yeah, we're in the infancy. And I think it's really exciting from a standpoint of what the opportunities are out there and what we could do with it. But it's also really daunting, right? As supply chain folks, like I think we understand the complexity of it, of just getting a product from A to B is hard enough. Now you're adding all these different variables. You just made it that much harder. Yep, yep. So talk about what's going on over at Shopify and Six River System. It's Six River, not Six, Six River. River. Correct. Six River. <laughs> it's Six River System, but our website is SixRiver.com. So yeah, you know, for us, it's really exciting looking at 2021 and beyond. I think, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking with Shopify at how do we enable and how do we empower brands and merchandise, you know, merchandisers, folks like that to really have the tools they need to meet their customers' needs today, wherever those needs may be. And I think with Six River, what we're really focusing on is that fulfillment side, that warehouse side, right? How can we enable and empower and provide the necessary services around that distribution center, that fulfillment, that picking that these customers are going to need moving forward? So, you know, looking towards 2021 and beyond, I think what we've seen with 2020 is obviously a massive acceleration in e-commerce. I personally believe you're going to see sort of a regression to the mean as we come out of COVID because, you know, one of the things we forget is that we don't forget, but we don't look at as much as a lot of spending that was allocated towards restaurants and travel and hotels has disappeared. We've just shifted that spending potentially to buying bread makers, right? And we just want to go out and shop now. (laughs) Right. And I think that's going to shift back where all of a sudden, you know, once we're out of this, you know, because of the vaccine and other things, like we're going to hopefully go back to travel and be in restaurants and hotels. So that slice of the pie that goes directly to buying goods online is going to shift a bit. But I think the trends and the mentality that has come through COVID will stick with us. So I think that's where, you know, we here at Six River Shopify are really focusing on allowing those brands and merchants moving forward to themselves be prepared to continue to meet their customers' needs because their customers' demands and needs have been crafted now or have been molded by COVID, while their spending might change a bit, their mentality is not going to change. Yep. And, you know, and again, I don't, I'm not saying this with a salesy hat on, I'm just pointing it out. Is anytime you're moving forward with technology, you really need to pick a partner because no one's going to go invest like uh, Six River Systems or Shopify in technology. So if you want to do this right going forward, whether it's, you know, becoming omni-channel or you know, starting an e-commerce business, it's you've got to go pick a partner. You're not going to go it alone. You're not going to say, hey, let's sit down and develop some nice software for us. Not just yeah. not going to happen. It's not going to, and it's, it's, you know, you do your job, which is to produce great products and, and to get customers and to get them interested in buying it. You know, let folks like us help you by doing our job, which is give you the best tools out there to do things like point of sale and, you know, websites and fulfillment and merchandising and all that. And I think that's absolutely how we found a lot of success with our customers. And I think we will continue to do so. Excellent. Excellent. So you guys have any upcoming events? You know, I think like all of us, a lot of virtual events coming up, you know, from the Six River side, we certainly look forward to having Flow in 2021, which is our annual user conference. You know, we had it last year in the fall. It was virtual. Uh, we will probably tend to lean towards that this year. But, you know, please do keep posted. Look at our we'll website. I'll put a link in the uh, show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. So we have some upcoming probably webinars and other things coming up. I know there's a, a webinar I'm part of into this month, not part of Six River, but I mean, from Six River, but from a third party. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of... Put that link in too. <laughs> we'll do. But yeah, so we have some good events and uh, looking forward to hopefully the not too distant future being able to do some of these in person. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. It would be nice to actually go somewhere and do something other than walk out to the porch and see what they <laughs> delivered. <laughs> So, uh, Guy, I really appreciate you taking the time. This is an interesting area. I mean, this is so much new going on. Joe, this would be great. Absolutely love to come back anytime, but this is great conversation. And then certainly, I think, an area that bears watching for the rest of the year and beyond, I certainly think we've only scratched the surface. And I think, you know, a lot of exciting things are coming up and a lot of challenges. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com.